Faith is the first, first principle. It's the foundation of Christianity. <clears throat> As we sang a moment ago, by it we see things that the world doesn't see. We're able to see Christ on the cross. We're able to see the miracles that he performed by faith. In Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6, we read, Without faith it is impossible to believe Him. For he who comes to God must believe that He is, and that He is a rewarder of those who diligently seek Him. Not only is it affirmed to be essential, Hebrews 10, verse 38 says, My righteous one shall live by faith. If he shrinks back, my soul has no pleasure in him. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, we walk by faith, not by sight. It's something that we must do, that we live by, and we walk by. It is the foundation of Christianity. Unfortunately, <laughs> I find it's one of the most misunderstood things in Christianity, and I find that a lot of my brethren misunderstand the fundamental nature and many very important things about faith. And if our foundation is faulty, the superstructure we build on it is not going to be much better. I think there are a number of serious consequences because of these misconceptions, and so let's think together about faith and what the Bible says about it this morning and begin perhaps with the world's view of faith, and I'm using world here in a pejorative sense, those who are opposite to Christianity. One good example would be H.L. Mencken. He was the reporter for the Baltimore Sun who ridiculed faith at the monkey trial uh, about 1925 in uh, Johnson City, Tennessee. He said, Faith may be defined briefly as an illogical belief in the occurrence of the improbable. And I think there are a lot of people who think that's what faith is. That if you're going to believe, if you're going to be a Christian, you have to check your mind at the door and just leave it and then just uh, quit thinking. It's illogical. I don't believe that's the case at all. I remember Jesus said in Matthew chapter 22, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. You don't check your mind at the door. But there are a number of questions that people have about faith that we want to look at. What's the source of faith? How do you come to have faith? Is it a gift from God? Is it instilled by your parents? Uh, by reading the Bible, which the Bible affirms, or only by reading the Bible, which is not the same idea, is there external evidence that's appropriate? Nature, archaeology? How do we get faith? And that's not a simple question. I think there are a lot of misconceptions about faith that we want to consider. There are people who think that conclusions that are based on evidence that we can defend are not really faith, that that's contrary to faith. I'm confident that's a misconception. There are many who think that evidence that we can defend is nice, but Christians accept truth by faith, not by evidence, and the two are contrary to each other. And I think these are fundamental misconceptions that we need to understand, that is, to understand the truth about it. Let's begin with the Bible definition of faith from Hebrews chapter 11. The King James says faith is evidence, poor translation and poor concept. Faith is assurance that I believe is based on evidence, as we'll see. Assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen, here is the New American Standard says. We come to be assured, we come to be convicted that something is true that we don't see or feel or touch. Now, is that an illogical process? I don't believe that's the case at all. Uh, we believe, have conviction in a lot of things that we don't see. How many of you here have ever met George Washington? Nobody here 
has met George White. How many ever shook his hand or heard him speak? But how many believe there was such a man? Well, yes, we, we, we see the evidence from the monument, from the paintings, from what he wrote, so much so that it just wouldn't be very reasonable to disbelieve that there was such a man. As you were driving to services this morning, you drove with faith that the fellow on the other side of the road is going to stay on his side of the road. Fairly reasonable conclusion, early Sunday morning. You were driving by faith. The farmer plants his seed, not knowing that there's going to be sunshine and rain, but having faith, he plants. This is not an unreasonable way to live. These are not unreasonable. Now, there are unreasonable positions and faiths and convictions that people do reach, but what's the difference? Why is it that we come to believe that Jesus is God's Son, that the Bible is His Word? Mama told us. Uh, a book says so. How do we know? Well, I think there's some wrong answers that we need to look at first that are very popular and a lot of people hold. And maybe from the practical standpoint, the reason a lot of people believe could be expressed in the expression, everybody knows that Jesus is God's Son. Of course, you get to the university and you seem to think nobody believes that Jesus is God's Son. And now then, that reason, if it's a reason, works in the opposite direction. And you go to other countries, and everybody believes in Mohammed, or everybody believes in Confucius, or all of the Hindu gods. And so, how effective is that concept? I, I don't think counting noses is ever a good way to determine truth. You remember Jesus in Matthew 7 said, There's a way that leads to destruction. The gate small, the way is narrow that leads to it, and few are they who find it. We don't want to be going the broad way that leads to destruction that many travel, but the few. And so we don't determine truth by majority or what everybody thinks. Probably, well, a great many people believe in the Koran. Uh, I don't think that's a weighty bit of evidence. Others will say, I believe because Jesus lives in my heart. I don't think that's a good reason either. Now, if you're a Christian, if you follow the Word of God, Jesus lives in your heart. The Bible says so. That's a fact based on the Scriptures. But is that good evidence is the question. You talk to the people who believe in the Koran, and you see their dedication, even giving their lives, blowing themselves up as suicide bombers. Uh, they have a God in their heart. The Muslims that flew the planes into the Twin Towers had a conviction in their heart, and their God lived in their heart. It's not reasonable to deny. Is that evidence that what they believed was true? I don't think so at all. If we accept this, then it fuels this modern pluralism, the acceptance of everybody who really deeply believes and condemns any condemnation of false doctrine if they really, really believe it in their heart. The heart's just really not a good basis for evidence. Jeremiah 17, verse 9 says, The heart is more deceitful than all else and desperately sick. Who can understand it? Proverbs 28, Solomon said very bluntly, He who trusts in his own heart is a fool. He who walks wisely will be delivered. Now, I didn't say that. <laughs> Solomon said that. I think he's right. But a lot of people are very foolish because that's where they put their confidence and that's how they believe. I think that's a wrong answer. Others say, well, you believe because of the experience of grace. And this is a very popular concept today. Uh, our Calvinistic friends tell us this is the way. You have to 
have the vision, you have to hear the voices, you have to have some kind of miraculous demonstration so that you come to believe. Think about that a moment in terms of the definition we looked at a moment ago from Hebrews chapter 11. Faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. If you see it, then it is by experience that produces knowledge, not faith. You touch it, that, that's an experience that, again, is not faith. Again, 2 Corinthians 5, we walk by faith, not by sight. If you see it, then you know. It's no longer faith. By definition, that doesn't work. We'll talk more about Thomas in just a moment, who had to touch. I think that came to be knowledge so that he could testify, but we'll speak of that in a moment. It's very popular for, for theologians today to talk about the leap of faith. You just hold off and do it, as we'd say in Texas. Uh, and then once you do it, it gets easier, and it gets stronger, and you get better at it. But you just do it without faith, in spite of the evidence, that is, without evidence, in, in spite of the evidence. How would you define prejudice? other than reaching a conclusion without the evidence, in spite of the evidence. Uh, you turn your back on the evidence and believe, in spite of what the evidence says, that's not really honest, is it? If you're going to love the truth and follow the truth with integrity, you don't turn your back on the truth or the evidence, the facts. We don't walk by prejudice. It's not founded on dishonesty, though I think a lot of what's called Christianity is. What's the right answer? And by the way, Proverbs 18, verse 13 says, He who gives an answer before he hears, it is folly and shame to him. That sounds like the leap in the dark to me. The right answer, I think, involves integrity, which is a love of the truth, following the evidence, and an, an evaluation of evidence. What is for, what is against. We might use the illustration of the scales, and here's the evidence favoring, and here's the evidence against. Which one weighs more? Integrity is going to follow the evidence. Prejudice may turn, their back on, uh, may turn its back on the evidence. I think that's the right answer. And I think we can defend that proposition and will in the rest of the session this morning. But people look at this and they say, no, wait a minute. Uh, you look at the apostles. You see what happened in New Testament times, and this is not what convinced the apostles, not what convinced Thomas or the apostle Paul. The apostles were persuaded by experience. On the road to Damascus, Paul had the experience, and then he came to be convicted that Jesus was God's son. And the answer to that misconception is that it didn't produce faith, it produced knowledge so that they could be witnesses. Now, one of the problems is people today in religion don't have a clue what it is to be a witness. That's been distorted and twisted. If you get in court and try to give testimony about something that you haven't seen, they're going to shut you up, aren't they? This is hearsay. That's not allowed. You've got to be competent. You've got to have seen to, to have been there in order to testify. When Ananias came to the Apostle Paul to explain to him what happened to him on the road to Damascus, in Acts 26, he said, Arise, stand on your feet. For this purpose I have appeared to you, so that you can have faith. No, that's not what he said. To appoint you a minister and a witness. Now the apostles were witnesses having been with Christ. Paul was born out of due season. But to be an apostle, he had to be a witness, and so the Lord appeared to him. And that's why, that's the purpose. And I said, not only the things which you've seen, but the things which I will appear to you. You remember back in Acts 1 when they were choosing one to take Judah's place. Who's going to be an apostle? 
we're told in verse 21, it's therefore necessary that of the men who have accompanied us all the time that the Lord went in and out among us, beginning with the baptism of John until the day that he was taken up from us, one of these should become a witness with us of his resurrection. John 15, Jesus said, you will bear witness also because you have been with me from the beginning. Clearly in 1 John, verse 1, what was from the beginning, what we've heard, what we've seen with our eyes, what we've beheld with our hands, handled concerning the word of life, we have seen, we bear witness. Now, that's what a witness is. Somebody who is persuaded by the testimony of someone else about something they haven't seen and goes out and tell people about it, they're telling, but that's not witnessing. It's a good idea, but it's not what witnessing is. I had a friend of mine, a preacher down in Fort Lauderdale, excellent preacher, was discussing this issue with some, and, and others in connection with it were talking about some ideas that others had presented to them. What do you think about Jehovah's Witnesses, he was asked. He said, I don't know, I've never seen one. Think about that. <laughs> Pretty good answer. In John chapter 20, we have reference to the event that was described to us just a moment ago, and I appreciate those comments. Verse 25 of John 20. The apostles came to Thomas. They had been there when the Lord appeared right there in the middle of them. They were scared to death. They were confused. They were disappointed, disillusioned, and here the Lord appeared. That, Thomas missed that. Just missed one sermon, but... Anyway, that's another sermon. We'll get to that. <laughs> we have seen the Lord. Here's eyewitness testimony that's presented to Thomas. And Thomas said, I don't believe you. I won't. And I hear, here are people that he knew were truthful people. Here, here's a bunch of them, and they said, we saw him. And he said, I don't believe it. I don't think that's being very honest. I don't think he was dealing honestly and fairly with the evidence at this point. Finally, he was persuaded by experience, by touching, when the Lord said, put forth your hand, touch my hands, my side. And Jesus said, because you have seen me, you believe. Blessed are people who do it differently. Those who did not see. Now, as we evaluate this in terms of the role of the apostles, we see now then you have a real good witness. Here's a skeptic. Here's a fellow who's really just so unfair that he's going to call his best friends liars and say it's not so, and he was persuaded. That fellow was. And he is bearing witness. You see, that's, that's even stronger, isn't it? That's the antagonistic witness, as we say sometimes. And that was the role of the apostles, and they had to see so that they could tell what they saw. But blessed are those who handle the evidence better than Thomas did, who look at evidence, not just believe whatever they're told. He goes on in the next verse and tells how they come to believe what they haven't seen, Many other signs, therefore, Jesus also performed in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written, here's eyewitness testimony written down, that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. We believe by looking at the evidence of eyewitness testimony. Now, that's, that's good evidence. If you get in the court and you're accused of murder, and 12 people stand up and say, I saw him do it. I was there. You're in serious trouble. <laughs> That's powerful evidence. And it's just that kind of evidence that we see convincing people throughout the New Testament. Let's look at those who were persuaded, those who came to believe, produced, uh, where we see faith produced. 
For example, in Acts chapter 2, there are those who murdered God's Son 50 days earlier, cried out, crucify Him, and now then they believe. How in the world did that happen? Well, they heard Peter's sermon. And it wasn't because Peter just says, all right, now you need to believe this. Peter had to persuade them, and he gave evidence. A lot of times we get to the end of Peter's sermon, and we don't see the rest of it, the major part of the sermon. We get to the Q&A and skip the main part. He starts out with prophecy. David says of him, and he shows the description of the Christ. They thought Christ was going to run off the Romans and be ruler of the world, and he died. Well, that's not what they were expecting. David said he had to die, but his flesh wouldn't see corruption. He prophesied of this. And then he says, we're all eyewitnesses. We saw it happen. We saw him die. We saw him alive. We ate breakfast with him out on the Sea of Galilee beside the sea. And then he says, here's the evidence that you all see and hear. The miraculous element, everybody hearing in their own language, being from every nation under heaven. And so here's point one and point two and point three. Therefore, he reaches the conclusion, no, assuredly. And what is faith? It's the assurance of things hoped for. How did they come to believe? Here is the evidence and here is the conclusion. Therefore, no, assuredly, have faith. And they were persuaded by that. When they felt this feeling in their heart. <laughs> or when they got the burning in their bosom, or when they had an experience. No. When they heard what Peter said. Well, but they were cut to the heart. Yes, they were persuaded that they had murdered God's son. How would you feel about that? You thought you were doing what's right, but you murdered the son of God. Why? Wow. If you weren't cut to the heart, there'd be something wrong with you, wouldn't it? It simply says they came to know assuredly and they understood they were sinners. Well, but it was the experience on Pentecost that convinced people. <laughs> and that's why they all spoke in tongues. How many spoke in tongues? Verse 7 says all that spoke in tongues were Galileans. Where was the crowd from? Every nation under heaven. Where were the apostles from? Back in the previous chapter, there by the tomb, the angel said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing into heaven? All that spoke were Galileans, the apostles. The Holy Spirit was operating through the inspired word of the apostles. But the people listened and evaluated the evidence and came to know assuredly and were cut to the heart because they were convinced they'd murdered God's son. That's what happened on the day of Pentecost. And you see Paul preaching exactly the same sermons later on. Of course, uh, Peter repeats that sermon in the next chapter there at the temple. We go to Acts chapter 17, and we see the production of faith on the part of Jews who didn't believe. He goes into the synagogue and reasons with them from the Scriptures. Why didn't he say, let's just take this leap in the dark? Or just wait for the burning in your bosom, this experience... That's not what he did. He was explaining and giving evidence that Christ had to suffer. They didn't think that he would, but he had to from, you, from what the Scriptures say, just like Peter did on the day of Pentecost, saying, This Jesus whom I'm proclaiming to you is the Christ. But he didn't just say, Be like little robins and open your mouth and accept this. He was giving the evidence, showing that they had to believe this, if they're going to be honest. And they were honest. They were noble-minded. Uh, not there in Thessalonica. Here down in Berea, they were more noble-minded. There in Thessalonica, some of them did believe, but not as many as the more honest ones down in Berea. In verse 11, they received the word with great eagerness, but not just because it was said. They examined to see if it was so. Therefore... They believe. Why, why did they believe? Well, I can't tell. I don't. It says they examined the evidence, therefore they believe. Why don't you know? It's not because of the experience. It's not because 
they leapt in the dark. It's because they looked at the evidence. They were honest. Now, these people, of course, were looking at the evidence from Isaiah 53, Psalm 69, Psalm 22, and those prophecies that showed that Jesus was the Christ. These people believed the Bible. Now, not everybody in New Testament times believed the Bible, and I have people say, well, if they don't believe the Bible, just forget about them. And if the apostles had had that attitude, they wouldn't have had very many people to talk to, would they? This is a good source of evidence, the Word of God. You see, especially if you're already convinced that it's God's Word, uh, and that's what it's talking about in Romans 10 when it talks about faith coming by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. But I get talked to some who are a little confused here, and they want to say only by the Word of God, and that's not what it says. We compare a similar mistake that's made in Romans chapter 5 on the subject of faith where it says we're justified by faith and some want to shoehorn the concept of only by faith into that passage and the only is not there. We see other places where other things are involved. And likewise in Romans chapter 10, some want to shoehorn only here, only by the word of God you get faith and that's not there. In the same chapter, Acts 17, where he said he was explaining and giving evidence, I think, from the Scriptures, we see him going on to Mars Hill there in Acts uh, chapter 17 uh, in Athens, and he doesn't quote from Isaiah. The, the philosophers there on Mars Hill wouldn't have been impressed by that. And so he starts where they are. We learn in education you don't start with sixth grade material when you're teaching first graders. And he just backed up and started where they were. Now, in our country, we've had the advantage of being able to skip to the sixth grade and start there with people who already believe the Bible is the Word of God, like Paul did in the first part of Acts chapter 17. That time is fast passing away. And more and more we're meeting people who don't begin with that conviction, and we have to back up like Paul did in Acts chapter 17, verse 28, and say, all right, here's some other evidence. Look what your poets have said. You accept these people as inspired, and I think we know more about that poet than is revealed here in this passage, but that's another lesson too. Think about your poet. We are the offspring of God. You accept this. Reason with me about it. Being the offspring of God, we ought not to think the divine nature is like gold or silver or an image. You think you offsprung from a rock? <laughs> you think you're the son of this silver idol? You, you really think that? Come on now. Even your poets tell you this. Pretty good argument, and it had an effect. It didn't convince all of them, but it moved some, and some became Christians. You remember in Romans chapter 1, Paul says, since the creation of the world, and he's talking about here the evidence that was presented to the Gentiles. His invisible attributes, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen. Now, how did you see the invisible attributes of God? That's, that's faith. They're understood by what has been made by the creation, and it's so obvious and so powerful that they are without excuse. Look at what's been made, like in Isaiah chapter 40. Lift up your eyes on high and see who has created these stars. The one who leads forth their host by number, he calls them by name. Because of the... You can see the greatness of His might in what has been created. You can see evidence from Isaiah, if you accept Isaiah as the Word of God. If you don't, let's just back up and begin to look at the things that have been made. Think about even what your poets have said, and let, let's come to faith in the Word of God. And you can see it clearly, so that they're without excuse. This is an interesting term excuse. The same word translated defense or answer in other places, it means a reasoned, rational explanation. They don't have one. When you look at all the evidence from the world around us, there's no, excuse, there, there's no defense for a lack of faith. 
It's the same word that we find in 1 Peter chapter 3 where we're commanded to be ready always to give an answer to everyone that asks, a reason of the hope that is in you, or defense in the New King James. It's the same word that you find back in Acts chapter 26 where Paul is on trial for his life. And he addresses King Agrippa, I'm about to make my defense. It's the kind of speech that a defense attorney makes. You be ready to give a defense. Well, I just leapt in the dark. <laughs> I don't think that's going to work, is it? I had this experience. I had better felt than told. You can't really... <laughs> it's not going to work. Christians have that which they can defend. And they're commanded to be ready. I remember very vividly the first time I was confronted with that responsibility. Uh, I was at Florida College in a, a class with Clinton Hamilton teaching evidences, and it had an impact on my life. He said, Don Patton, you stand up, and here's an 18-year-old, just grew up in a Christian home. Uh, you tell the class why you believe Jesus is God's Son, why you believe the Bible is... I'm, I'm an unbeliever. You give me your defense. Okay. Uh, there's prophecies. What prophecies? Well, they're in there somewhere. <laughs> well, what other evidence do you have? Well, there's secular historians. What secular historians? Uh, well, there's Josephus and uh, Barastus. Pretty good for an 18-year-old. He says, Josephus mentioned a fellow named Crispus. Might have been Christ. We can't really tell. Barossus was uh, way out of date. I, I mentioned Tertullian as well. He said he was 200 years too late. All of which was not so. <laughs> but I didn't know it. And I folded. it. You know, okay, 200 years too late. I, and my defense just fell flat. And one of the best things that ever happened to me, because I got ready. And I hope you are as well. And if we were to go around the room this morning and ask you to stand up and give your defense, I hope you could do a better job. And that if someone disagreed and opposed, that you could defend the defense. But that's what New Testament Christians did. They were convinced on the basis of the evidence and they could go tell people about it. And that's what this week is about, to help us prepare for that kind of defense. And I appreciate uh, those who understand that need and provide for such opportunities. But so many have misconceptions about faith that they're totally unprepared. Ideas have consequences, and let's think for a moment before we conclude this morning about the consequences of the misconceptions of the nature of faith. If you think it comes by experience, which is not what faith is, it's, that's knowledge, but if you think that and you're going to be lost without it, you have to have faith in order to go to heaven, and you have to have this experience to have faith, then you better have an experience. And the power of suggestion is, is very powerful sometimes. And you get down and you pray for this and you pray through till finally, guess what? You have one through the power of experience, through the power of suggestion. Um, hypnotism is an illustration of people seeing things through the power of suggestion that, that's not there, but they see it. And you get people who understand they're going to be lost if they don't see it, and they get around with their friends and they pray with the powerful suggestion they have to see it. Guess what happens? They, they see it. I remember an experience one time. Some of you may know Brother Tommy Porch, a very capable gospel preacher. Back when we were youngsters, we were with a group of young people, and there was a hypnotist there, and he took Tommy off in a room and hypnotized him and told him that Don Patton had a tail. And when he came back into the room, he looked at me, and his eyes bugged out, and, you know, what, what's going on, Tommy? Well, look at Don. He's got a tail. <laughs> and he saw it. 
Now, how do you combat that? You can say, Tommy, you don't believe in evolution. You've never seen a man with a tail before. We didn't come from apes. It doesn't matter. He sees it. You know, that, the process that God has designed to produce faith now is not working very well, is it? Because of this delusion that comes through this powerful suggestion that he's received. And so many times we talk to our friends and neighbors and we show them the evidence, but they've seen through this power of suggestion and are deluded. And you need to back up with such an individual and show them what the basis of New Testament faith is. Look, it's point one, it's point two, it's point three. Here's how they were persuaded. They examined the evidence. And these people are denying it because of what they feel. And what you're dealing with is a fundamental misconception about the basic nature of faith. But if you're told that you just believe in spite of the evidence, you just do it, people get pretty good at that. You know, looking the other way at the evidence. And, and people think that's what Christianity is. That's how you do Christianity. You look the other way at the evidence and just hold your convictions. You ever talk to people like that? Many times it's a direct product of the misconception of faith. They think that's how to do it. And they're doing it. And it doesn't really matter what kind of evidence you present. They have been taught to look the other way. Like Mark Twain talked about going to his neighbor's door to borrow the axe. And his neighbor says, no, I, you can't borrow my axe. My wife's making soup. And he thought, what, what does that have to do with borrowing your axe. And he says, well, one excuse is as good as another if I don't want to loan you my axe. And we get this impression when we go try to talk to people about the, the gospel, and it doesn't really matter. They just say whatever they want. And it, they've been taught to ignore all the facts. And one excuse is as good as another. They misperceive the nature of faith. Well, let's think for a minute about the difference when a person is determined to weigh the evidence and follow the evidence wherever the truth leads. In the first place, this person's going to listen because the evidence is where it's at. And like the noble Bereans, they are ready to listen. There's some people that are not ready to listen because the evidence has nothing to do with it. But people who go at it this way will. And furthermore, they will learn and know the truth. God promises that. John 7, if any man willeth to do his will, and that's a difficult phrase to translate it. It involves a will to know and a will to do. And what's the promise? He shall know. This is an, a person with an honest heart who's really wanting to know. Jesus says, you'll know of the teaching, whether it's from God or whether I speak for myself. Other version, Marshall's version says, if he wishes the will of him to do. He has that desire and the desire to do. Now, let's look at the corollary to that, the opposite promise. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Here's a person who doesn't receive a love of the truth. What's going to happen? For this reason, God will send them a strong delusion, a deluding influence. They're not going to know the truth. If you will to know you'll know. If you don't will to know, if you don't love the truth, you won't. That says you better be honest. You better follow the evidence. Furthermore, the person who has the idea of weighing the evidence is somebody who will teach because they've been convinced on the basis of the evidence in the first place. And like those in Acts chapter 8 who had been convinced because they were persuaded by the facts went out and you couldn't shut them up. I had a lady who was telling me the other day, that Brother Pat and I had a Jehovah's Witness come knock on the door, and my faith was strong. I just slammed the door in their face. <laughs> Maybe their prejudice was strong. But the way to fix that is you sit that person down in the class and you teach them what they teach and what the Bible says and how to show them that this is not the truth and what the truth is now then they knock on the door and they'll just twist their arm off dragging them in to try to get them to sit down and talk. And that's because they know what and they know why. And they can defend it. And they're 
like a hunter with a new dog. They want to go try it out. Finally, they will stand. Notice Paul's words to Timothy. Here were people who were overthrowing the faith of some. How many, uh, how many is uh, Phileas the teaching the resurrection is already past. Their word is spreading like a gangrene. What, how do young preachers react when they see this happening? Discouraged. Well, a lot of people have changed their mind, and maybe everybody believed the wrong thing. Nevertheless, Paul says, the firm foundation of God stands. Those facts haven't changed, no matter how many people turn away, how much gangrene you see affecting the, the facts are still the facts. And if that's what your faith is based on, you don't move, you don't budge, no matter what anybody else does. Now, what do we see in the body of Christ today? Do we see people who are not interested in listening that are not right and, and, and are not really interested in getting right and who won't get out and teach people and who won't stand when tribulation comes? I think it's a matter of faith. I think it's because of misconceptions and not having the kind of faith they had in New Testament times that they can defend. I think it has all kinds of consequences. The real key to what we're talking about this morning is seen in Luke chapter 8 where Jesus is talking about the various soils, and there are some people who are just not interested in the truth. Bounces off like water off a duck's back or like seed off of a stone. But they're not all that way. We're looking for those with good and honest hearts that are interested in the truth and that will follow the evidence and that are honest enough to say, I want the truth that have the attitude that Solomon was talking about in Proverbs 23. He said, you buy the truth. Well, what does it cost? It doesn't matter what it costs. What else in this world is as valuable? This is what makes us free. This is what gets us from this world of degeneration and death to yonder world of crowns of eternal life. You buy the truth, no matter what it costs. And you don't sell it, no matter what's offered. 